God. If you have your Bible, would you please turn to Exodus chapter 26? And you know, when Candy and I finally settled on the reality that God was calling us to plant City Life Church um, in the heart of Vicksburg, Mississippi, one of the first things that we did is we put our house that we had in the county on the market because we felt like that if God was calling us to um, to plant a church in the heart of the city, that we needed to plant our lives there as well. And so we we immediately started house shopping. We put our house on the market. Um, um, Pastor Corey sold it for us in record time, and we were out of the house before you know it with no house, right? And so we and so we were shop, house shopping, and as we were house shopping, um, during during the shopping, we walked out of a house that we were viewing, and when we walked out of that house, it was nice, but it wasn't quite what we wanted, and as we were walking out, Candy looked across the street at another great-looking house that was not for sale, and without ever having looked inside of the house, Candy said, look looked over to me and said, I really wish that house was for sale. I think that would work great for everything that we are trying to do. And I agree with her, but I mean, the house wasn't for sale, so what, what do you do, right? You say, you nod your head and say, yeah, you know what I mean? That would have worked great, and we both agreed that that would have worked great, and then we went about our business. And we ended up doing a little more shopping, and eventually we ended up settling on a house that we were going to buy, and we made an offer, and the offer was accepted. And here's where the story gets crazy. We were preparing to move into this house, and we had final things to do, last-minute inspections, and so those inspections happened, and something came up wrong with the house. And then when that came up, we started trying to negotiate with the sellers to see if there was something we could do. And there was, and they they said, no, we're not gonna do anything. And so literally the deal was abolished. It stopped, it it, it was destroyed, right? And so we're still without a house. So that same night, I went back online to start looking at houses, house shopping again. And lo and behold, guess what house was on the market? So I immediately clicked on the house and I immediately put in information saying, hey, we are interested in this house. I got a call from the owners the next day and they said, hey, um, we, we were actually just fooling around with the website. We, we weren't actually ready to sell the house yet. We were, I was just online last night and you must have... You must have stumbled on this at the same time I was online playing with the house. So we're nowhere near ready to sell the house yet. But um, if you guys are ready to buy a house, then we will make provision to sell the house. And I said, well, we're ready to buy that house, I think. But we need to at least look inside it. You guys good with that? And they said, yeah, yeah, we're good. And so we set up an appointment to just go in. They were obviously living there. Stuff was everywhere because they hadn't even thought about preparing it for sale yet. And so we walked in, looked at it, and Candy said, yeah, this is it. And so we said, yeah, we would like to put an offer in. We put an offer in, and the rest is history. They sold a house to us. So God moved in a way that we just weren't expecting, and he moved and made provision for us to be in a house And initially, the only thing we could do was look at the outside of it and say, man, that looks like a beautiful house. I think we want to be in that house. There's something about that house where we want to be there. You know, sometimes we can get an indication that a place is special just by looking at the outside of it. And so on last week, we took a look at the inside of the tabernacle and that this ancient tent that was constructed by Israel from a blueprint designed by God himself. And this week, we want to take a deeper look at what is going on on the inside, or the outside, rather, of this, of this construction. And what is God using the tabernacle to say to us and reveal to us? One thing that we know that God is doing when we look at this tabernacle is that he is reminding us that he desires to dwell with us. Very few people had the privilege of actually going inside of this construction. Only the priests were allowed in the holy place and only the high priest was allowed in the most holy place. It was a sacred place because God came and made his dwelling there. The tabernacle was a demonstration of God's desire to to dwell with his people, a desire that was demonstrated from the very beginning of creation. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, we read that as Adam and Eve were committing grave sin and transgression before God, 
When God began to search them out, the Bible says in verse 8 of chapter 3 of Genesis that they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. From the very beginning, God has sought to be present with his people in holy communion and fellowship, walking amongst us and with us in the cool of the day. And from the very beginning, God's people have had to back, backpedal from God due to their sin. The tabernacle was yet another expression of God's desire to be with us. But it's also communicating that God's intent to dwell with us had to be on his terms and not ours. This tabernacle had a specific design and a specific construction to it. Exodus 26 tells us that the covering of the tent was beautifully adorned with multi-layered and multi-colored and multi-fabric custom curtains. Verses 1 through 6 describe these curtains. It talks about there were 10 curtains that were made of linen, and they had blue and purple and scarlet yarn woven within them. And they had cherubim skillfully worked into them, embroidered literally into the curtains. And the length of the curtains were, were roughly about 42 feet long, 10 curtains in all, 42 feet long, 6 feet wide. And, and these ten curtains were sewn into two sets of five. And they were connected by 50 gold clasps. And these curtains served as the first layer of the roof and the side of the tabernacle. These curtains made of linen and blue and scarlet and purple yarn. Verse 7 through 14 highlight more layer of curtains. The second layer is made with goat hair, wool, if you will. So there's this strong wool fabric, 11 curtains in all. So there's 10 of the linen curtains and 11 of the wool curtains. And these curtains were a little bit longer than the, than the linen cur curtains. 42 feet for the linen, 44 feet for the wool and it was intended to just be a little bit longer because it was an overlapping happening. And on top of that layer was two more layers. And both of these layers were made of some form of leather. And so there was the, the ram skin leather, which was the third layer of the four. So you got the linen, wool, ram skin. And then it seems like the fourth layer, it does not, it, it, it's not as specific, but there, it, it's believed by most scholars that it was a, ma, a marine mammal, if you will. So the leather on the fourth layer, some translations even call it sea cow. So there's leather on two layers to weatherproof this roof, so to speak, and to keep water and damage away from the holy furniture and instruments that are in there. In verse 15 through 19 in chapter 26, describe the framing of this facility. Almost 50 acacia wood pillars are all around this construction. And they're 15 feet high, each pillar, and two and a quarter feet wide. And each of these pillars is overlaid with gold, and they're each supported by two silver base, each pillar. So you're looking at 48 pillars all around, 20 on one side, which of course is 20, 20, actually is 20 on the south end, 20 on the north end, and then eight on the far west end, which is the back of the tabernacle, because the tabernacle, you enter in from the east. And then you have 15 acacia wood crossbars that were overlaid in gold as well. And these were used to lock all the pillars in place. So you had five on one side, five on the north, five on the south, and then five on the west to lock this thing all in place. And it also kind of served as instruments for the curtains to hang off of. And so that's what you saw in that video that we showed. That was, that was the construction of it all as best as we can visualize it today. And then finally in verses 31 through 37, we get two more elements. The curtain separating the holy place from the most holy place. 
and the screen that serves as an entrance into the tent on the east side. Verse 31, it says, And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine twine linen, and it shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. There's the, there's the cherubim again. We saw the cherubim was worked into the curtains that served as the roof and the side, but we also see the cherubim being worked into the curtain that separates the holy from the most holy. That's important. Verse 32, it says, And you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasp and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. So the, so the ark... The, the ark where God dwells goes behind the curtain into the most holy place. And you shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. So the mercy seat is the covering of the ark overlaid in gold. This is the place where it serves as God's throne on earth. Verse 35 says, and you shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand on the south side of the tabernacle opposite the table, and you shall put the table on the north side. And then it talks about the screen in verse 30, 36. You shall make a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen embroidered with needlework. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold, and you shall cast Five bases of bronze for them. Notice there's a transition from silver to bronze. The far, farther you get out from the presence of God, the more things become common. You tracking? So here we have this final setup for the inside. This massive imposing curtain is set up between the most holy place and the holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is placed and the mercy seat is placed on top of the Ark. And then the holy place has the table where the showbread is placed and that table is on the north end of that space. And on the south end of that space, we have the lampstand. We talked about the table and the lampstand last week, so if you, have not, if you have not caught up with us, you can link on YouTube and, or you can catch up on YouTube from last week's sermon. So all of that is what's happening on the inside, and then we have this entrance screen. And again, it's comprised of all sorts of patterns and fabrics and colors. And so as you can imagine, the tabernacle was a very large and imposing structure in the midst of all these little tents that are around it in Israel's wilderness experience. But this imposing structure was intended to communicate this major truth, and that is this. There is only one way to God. The south end, the north end, and the west end were all locked down. There was only one way in, and it was through the east end where the screen was designed. And it was intended to show that you could not go to God through any other way but through the east end. And when you went through the east end, you had to pass an altar in order to get into the tent. An altar table that was reserved for sacrifices for the tabernacle. Again, God desired to dwell with Israel. God desires to tabernacle, if you will, with Israel and with us. But it had to be according to his terms. And the terms were established primarily as a result of our sin. Remember, God walks freely amongst us in Genesis 3. In the cool of the day. Now, we are required only to go in through this east side entrance in order to visit with God. You see, despite the provision that was made for God to dwell amongst us, our sin still limited our exposure to him. And some of you feel that today. In fact, I'm sure some of you have felt that or at least wondered that in your life. Some of you have thought to yourself, can I ever experience God with the sin that is in my life? 
with the baggage that I got, the things that I've done? Can I ever experience a real, bona fide, genuine relationship with God? Will God ever draw near to me with the level of messiness and brokenness and rebellion that my life is shaped by? Can I ever really know real relationship with God with all the junk that lives in me? Has anybody ever felt that way? Does God do anything about this or does he just leave us in this state? Let's keep going and find out. Again, there's one important element that shows up over and over again in the construction of the tabernacle. I highlighted it a moment ago, and you see it at the very beginning of chapter 26. Read verse 1. It says this. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and you shall make them with cherubim skillfully worked into them. You see it again in chapter 26, verse 31. Look with me there. And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, and it shall be with cherubim skillfully worked into it. You even see it in verse uh, chapter 25 as God lays out blueprint for how to construct the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. Chapter 25, verse 18 through 20, look with me there. It says, you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the other, on one end, and and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. Cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. Throughout the tabernacle construction, the Lord has placed the cherub, the cherubim. What is the significance of that? In the cherubim, we are reminded of what once was and what actually is and can be. In the cherubim, we are reminded of what once was and what actually is and can be. First, the tabernacle offers us a taste of what we've missed through the symbols of the cherubim. In the book of Genesis, part of the curse from the fall of Adam and Eve is they are banished from Eden, the place where God dwelled and walked amongst them in the cool of the day. And when they are banished, we get this in verse 22 of chapter 3 in Genesis. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The cherubim placed throughout the tabernacle would have served as a reminder of where sin had taken them. However, it also should serve as a reminder of where sin has taken us away from the presence of God, away from Eden, no longer approachable like it was in Eden. No, there are other theologians that have also pointed out the parallels between the tabernacle and the Garden of Eden because the tabernacle serves as a slow recovery back to what we have lost. Theologian James Hamilton points out some of the parallels between the Garden of Eden and the tabernacle. For one, there were seven spoken acts of creation in Eden. There were also seven spoken acts of creation in the tabernacle. God said to Moses, do this. God spoke in the beginning in Genesis and said this. 
Number two, Eden and the tabernacle were both places where God would dwell amongst his people. Number three, Eden and the tabernacle stories were both stories that ended with an emphasis on Sabbath rest. Number four, Eden and the tabernacle stories both had falls in them. We've read about the fall in chapter 3 of Eden, I mean chapter 3 of Genesis, but we will later read about the fall of Exodus, in Exodus, where once Moses gets these instructions, he finds his people constructing and erecting a golden calf to worship. And then number five, the par- uh, fifth parallels, both accounts tell us about the cherubim guarding the presence of God at the east entrance. But Hamilton rightly points out here that in Eden, the cherubim only served as a mark of banishment. When we saw the cherubim in Eden, they were intended to communicate, you are no longer welcome. But now, the cherubim are welcoming back the people into the presence of God through the blood of sacrifice that they bring to sprinkle on the mercy seat. The cherubim show us that God is doing something to bring us back to himself. Which leads us to the second point, that the cherubims are speaking to us when we look at them in the tabernacle construction. The cherubims remind us of what we missed in Eden, but they also point us to what we are longing for in heaven. The tabernacle offers us a taste of what we are longing for. The prophet Ezekiel describes a vision in chapter 1 of his book where cherubims are present in guarding the throne of God, four of them in fact. He speaks of these spectacular beings in a spectacular way. But then later on, the apostle John repeats this vision or this sight in his own vision in Revelation. John describes the features and the duties of these creatures in chapter 4, verse 8 of Revelation. He says this, and the four living creatures... Each of of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So, with those two pictures in mind, the cherubim flanking the throne of God, Declaring his holiness, or de- declaring his mightiness, declaring his eternal reality, his eternal nature, with the tabernacle adorned with these divine beings etched and embroidered into the curtains on the exterior and on the interior and even on the Ark of the Covenant itself, we are getting a glimpse into heaven through the tabernacle. In fact, we read in Hebrews chapter 8 that the tabernacle serves as a shadow and a copy of that which is in the heavens. The cherubim in the tabernacle is a sign to us that through though our sin pushed us out of Eden, God in his relentless love for us keeps pursuing us, and in pursuing us has made provision for us by coming down from heaven and dwelling among us. The cherubim are the images that tie Eden and heaven to the tabernacle. In other words, what we have lost, God is restoring back the ability to dwell with him. There's one last thing on the exterior that I want to look at. It begins in chapter 27, verse 1. Would you read that with me? Chapter 27, verse 1 through 8, it says, You shall make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long, five cubits broad. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits And you shall make horns for it on its four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. And you shall overlay it with bronze. And you shall make pots for it to receive its ashes and shovels and basins. 
and forts and fire pans. And you shall make all of his utensils of bronze. And you shall also make it for grating, a network. I'm sorry, you shall also make for it a grating, a network of bronze. And on the net, you shall make four bronze wings at its four corners. And you shall set it under the ledge of the altar so that the net extends halfway down the altar. And you shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. And the poles shall be put through the ring so that the poles are on the two sides of the altar when it is carried. You shall make it hollow with boards. As it has been shown you on the mountain, so shall it be made. So on the outside, We've described the tabernacle, the exterior of the tabernacle, and all of the significance of that exterior, or at least some of the significance of that exterior. There's plenty more to dive into that we don't have time for. But on the outside of this exquisitely constructed tent was a courtyard and an altar, and this altar was about seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide. It was a square shape, about four and a half feet high. And this altar and all of its utensils were overlaid with bronze, not to be confused with the gold on the inside. And the bronze, again, was to serve as a reminder that God was not present in his heightened way outside of the tent as he was inside of the tent. And the poles were made with acacia wood and overlaid with bronze. And like all the other furniture with poles, these poles were used to carry the altar wherever Israel went. In other words, Israel just couldn't pack up the tabernacle and pack up the ark and pack up the, the uh, table of showbread on the inside of the tabernacle and say, we're going to take the ark we're going to take the table of showbread and the furniture inside of the ark, and, you know, we don't necessarily need the altar outside. No, 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 no. They had to take the altar too. Why? Because wherever the tabernacle traveled, wherever God's manifested presence was, there was a sacrifice that would be demanded. Wherever God's manifested presence was, wherever God chose to dwell, there must attend with that dwelling a sacrifice. You see, at this altar, animals were offered, blood of bulls and goats. And just like the ark and the table of showbread, the altar was required because entrance into God's presence required a sacrifice. God's desire was to move the people back to Eden, to bring heaven down to dwell with them in the cool of the day, but our entrance depended on the shedding of blood. In fact, Hebrews chapter 9 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. God gave Moses the law to reveal himself to, the, uh, to his people and to us, but the law couldn't bring us to God because the law couldn't stop us from sinning against God. In fact, our, as, we, as the law is revealed to us and we sin, we are pushed farther from God. The distance that you sometimes feel, the hopelessness that you sometimes feel, the lack of fellowship that you sometimes feel, it is the reality of sin in your life and sin in my life. It separates us. We look and we behold a holy and a perfect God and we say to ourselves, how can we draw near when we are so far from where he is? And Israel was reminded of that. Every time they walked by the bronze altar, they were reminded that they needed blood in order to approach this God. But brothers and sisters, the answer to our dilemma comes not in this tabernacle. As spectacular as this tabernacle was, it was intended to serve as only a foreshadow of something greater to come. In John chapter 1, verse 14, we hear these words. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Now pay attention to the word dwelt in verse 14 of John chapter 1. Because it comes from the same word in the Greek that we established the word tabernacle. What does it mean? It means that when Christ came, he came and tabernacled amongst us. Tabernacled with us. Christ came and tabernacled with us. Literally, Christ came and became the tabernacle. But not only the tabernacle, but Christ came and he became the priest who enters in the tabernacle because Hebrews tells us that he is our high priest. But not only the priest and the tabernacle, Christ came and became the sacrifice because the Bible tells us in Romans that he was the propitiation for our sins. And so now the sacrifice has been provided in Jesus. The tabernacle has been provided in Jesus. The priest has been provided in Jesus. Everything that we need in order to draw near to God and have God dwell with us has been provided in Jesus. Everything that we need in order to draw near to God and have God dwell among us and in us has been provided through Jesus. Hebrews chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 11 through 14, it says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal Redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Here's what that means. It means that though your sin be plenty, the sacrifice of Christ is sufficient. He offered eternal redemption. So let us draw near to the throne of God. Why? Because we are perfect? Of course not. Let us draw near to the throne of God because the Christ has come down and tabernacled amongst us and died the death that we all deserved and became the high priest offering his own sacrifice on our behalf and securing for us eternal redemption. Yes, you are sinful. Yes, I am sinful, but Christ is more. Christ is sufficient for you. Some of you feel distant from God, and you wonder, how can I draw close? Draw near to Jesus. Draw near to Jesus. If you draw near to Jesus, you have privilege to have God dwell with you. It's like the house me and Candy looked at across the street that became our own. We looked across the street. We saw it from the outside. We said, man, that looks like a really special house. But we can't get in. Sometimes there are some of us that are looking on the outside and with the weight of our sins saying, man, it looks special. He looks special. But man, I got to do this and I got to do that and I'm going to have to do this and I'm going to have to stop doing this and I'm going to have to stop doing that. And then eventually once I stop doing all of that, then maybe, maybe, maybe I can get in. Maybe I can get into where he dwells. Saints of God, I'm telling you that the same God that made provision for me and Candy Crawford to walk into the house that we walked in. That God has made provision for you and I to walk into his tabernacle. And that provision has come through his son, Jesus Christ. And not only has he made that provision for you and I to come into that tabernacle, but the Bible says that you too are now a temple in which he dwells. 
that because, because of the work that Christ has done, you now have become a living and abiding tabernacle by which God dwells in. And guess what happens? Now the world is supposed to look on the outside of you and say what? Man, what can I do to get inside? The world is supposed to look on the outside of this church and say to themselves, man, what can I do to be on the inside? And we can point them to the same one who gained us entry. We can point them back to Jesus and tell them that through Jesus you have entry. We were once banished from paradise, but through Christ we have entered back into paradise and we will see it fully when all is said and done in this world. Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you so much and we thank you.